Well, my iPad tells me it's time to start. I don't know if we're technically ready. Someone can wave a red flag if we still need to wait. If we are, welcome everyone. Tere tulemast. Järgnev debatt toimub inglise keeles ja sünkroon tõlget minu teada ei ole. Nii et, ma loodan, et kõik, kes siia on kohale jõudnud, tunnevad ennast inglise keeles mugavalt. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the festival. Welcome everyone who's here uh, hidden under those tents very wisely because I think it's going to rain soon. At least that's what the weather forecast told us and that's what we've seen so far. Welcome everyone who's uh, following us uh, live uh, on the web stream. We're going to talk about the expectations and the political reality uh, of the youth of the future in Europe, what the youth want and what they might get. So we have an excellent panel here, uh, very young but uh, very experienced, it seems. Officially, <coughs> one person is not young anymore, uh, the rest of us uh, still are. <laughs> you can all guess uh, who's... Uh, who's approaching the midlife crisis, but um, uh, we have a great panel starting from my right, uh, Kristen Aigro from Estonian Roundtable of, for Development Cooperation and former board member of the Euro Youth European Council. Hi. European Youth European Forum. European Youth Forum, okay, yeah. <laughs> but everybody First mistake this, already so. <laughs> in the introduction from a journalist. So uh, then we have um, Gustav Götzberg, member of the Swedish Moderate Party. Hello. Hello. Uh, you're waiting for Brexit, I understand, to go to the European <laughs> Parliament. Yes, I am, but that was a secret. But thank you for pointing it out. <laughs> right, right, okay. <laughs> then we have Lucas Ilves, who has a lot of titles, but let's just say that he's currently head of strategy at Gartime. Is that correct? That is correct. Wonderful. And then we have uh, the very experienced Glenn Nerats, who is the uh, Director for European Union Affairs at the Estonian Government Office. How, for how long will you still hold on to that post, Glenn? We'll see. <laughs> Very diplomatic answer. So um, we also have uh, questions for you, the, the good audience, and uh, I would like to actually know you better. Uh, I know some of you, but not all of you. So for a little warm-up exercise, um, I suggest you take out your smartphones, those of you who haven't done so yet. Find your way to worksup.com. You have all actually the, um, the, the coordinates uh, in a very old school manner nailed to that tree uh, over there. So when you go to worksup.com, you have to enter the event ID, which is future 2035. So future and then numbers, 2035. Then you should head to um, a place which has a title Tasks, and there you have three questions. And these three questions are there for me to know you better. So the three questions should be um, as <coughs> followed. Do you, do you follow uh, politics and events related to the EU? You can choose yes, no, or I don't know. Do you believe that you are able to influence EU decision-making process? And do you feel that the EU needs a change? Could you kindly um, yeah, find a minute to answer those uh, three questions? 
And then we're gonna see uh, what you guys thought after the I ask the first questions from this great young experienced panel. So to to start off our discussion, I must say I was a bit um, I was a bit tempted to talk about everything because well, what do we want from the future and what <coughs> do we actually get? It's a pretty wide topic, but I narrowed it down a bit. So let's first talk about the youth in politics in in general and uh, i mean when you when you look at the statistics the youth the millennials as they call it those people aged from 18 to 35 they make up roughly a quarter of uh, eu's population right a bit less than 100 million what 90 million youth in in that age bracket and but at the same time they have a record of not showing up to the uh, polls now, in 2014, there was just like 27% of youth that age who voted in the EU election. And Kristen, you've actually campaigned for lowering the voting age. But I mean, when we look at that turnout, what good is lowering the voting age if the youth don't really show up? Yeah, I mean, lowering the voting age to me is a more broad question than just having young people show up. Voting is a right. And so we need to ask the question of um, how old are you, um, at what age are you ready to vote? And that's where we should draw the line. Uh, this is actually the process we went through in Estonia because uh, I formerly work with the Estonian National Youth Council and they are the first NGO in Estonia to change the constitution, so to lower the voting age. Uh, this was a very thorough work. We work with researchers in Tallinn University, um, and the research really shows that at that age, young people are ready to vote. They understand society and societal processes well enough to do it. But they don't. Many of them don't. Yes. And so if we progress to that, um, then it becomes more complex because uh, the share of young people in society is smaller and smaller. We are an aging society in Europe. Therefore, politicians have less and less incentive to actually speak to young people or make promises to young people and their focus is towards older generations, meaning that politics really ends up leaving young people behind. So you think the problem for voter apathy is caused by politicians who are, well, middle-aged guys mostly, or older guys, talking to similar-minded people and not really looking at what young people want or what do they want to hear? I think that's a lot of the problem, that uh, our politicians are too similar. Uh, we need more diversity amongst politicians. We need more young people who are actually elected uh, and who are, get electable positions within political parties, because that's a whole other conversation and challenge. Um, but, uh, but indeed, uh, the sad fact is that, of course, because older people are more ac a more active voter group, there, it makes sense to target them, and there's very little incentive to actually talk to young people and to talk about the issues that young people care about. So our political system is broken in that way, I would say. Right. Well, we have a fix, or we have an example of a guy trying to fix that from Sweden. Hi, Gustav. Hello. So why did you decide to go into politics? I mean, the last debate, I think, concluded with the sad uh, note that uh, politics isn't really uh, attractive for uh, for young people or for the bright uh, guys in general why did you make that call and i mean you joined a conservative party that's that's something. at the age of 12 yeah. uh, <laughs> which i don't right. really recommend to anybody even though i think that you have passed that that limit of being 12 years old uh, no i i i, I don't think that i s me myself serves as a good example of talking about young people in in, in politics per se because i joined the political party of mine in Sweden back when I was uh, 12 years old in 2015. So now you can add on how old I am. Um, I think that for me it was because I was very interested in, in politics and in news. I always watched the news on the television with my mother and father back home. I, my first memory is not of me riding in a bicycle. It's a memory from the war in Bosnia in 1998. So for me it has always been there. Uh, what I see now is not a, I wouldn't say apathy when it comes to young people in politics. I think that, as a matter of fact, we see more incentives and more ways of young people are getting in, involved in politics, not in the old-fashioned way, but in other ways. You don't have to join a political party these days to make a change in society. And my fellow Swede Greta Thunberg might be a good example of that as well, that you can really do something and you can really make sure that you can change society to, to the better 
uh, even if you don't wear a suit and run for parliament. But I mean, do you agree with this notion that in general politicians these days in Europe, they really don't care what the youth think? No, because I don't think that you can say that there's a way you think. I think very, very different from a 25-year-old communist. Uh, because we are young, of course, and of course we have some, some mutual perspectives, but we are also individuals and we have different ideas and we have different uh, experiences and we live in Paide or we live in Gothenburg or we live in Oslo, we live anywhere else. And I think that that is a perspective as well, that you can't really say that youth, young people from the age of one to the age of 30 is some kind of an 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 uh, alienated uh, group of people who are not you know uh, who who re who who really has uh, s the same ideas just because they're age no, because i think we can all agree with that but i mean but what what what, uh, what was just said was that well politicians in general they don't really care what the younger generation thinks because well there aren't too many of them and they never vote the older guys vote do you have that practical experience when looking at your colleagues in the parliament not really. We have a saying, and, and uh, an anonymous member of the Swedish Parliament said that it's, of course, it's very important to listen to old voters, but we should always recall that they might be dead to the next election. Uh, having that said, with a sense of humor, I think it's also essential to realize that the young people not re really are the future, because we are, we know that for sure, and that is some kind of a cliche, but we're also knowing that young people have now a force within them with social media and everything else, making sure that they can really create turmoil and chaos if the older politicians don't listen to them. And I think that that social change and social activity is something quite new and something good and vi vital for, for the public debate. Right. We're going to get into technology and social media on the second half of the discussion. But Lucas, I mean, you have all the prerequisites of uh, getting into politics, right? Uh, your family, I mean, your father, all the experience in the world concerning politics. You've worked as a civil servant. You've, be, you've seen how policymaking works. Why don't you want to uh, enter that, yeah. that cycle? I'll get to that in a second, but first I, I want to point out that Estonia disproves maybe some assertions or the hypothesis that youth in politics make a big structural change in how politics are run. I mean, we have a country where two of the last two prime ministers were under 40 when they took office. And if you look at the age of our ministers, many of our MPs, it would appear that we are nirvana when it comes to youth and politics. But does that change our politics in any appreciable way? As a civil servant, I can say that the most youthful ministers that I've worked for in mind were in their 50s and 60s. And they were actually, and this is a question of individuals, they were actually much more open and dynamic than the ministers I've worked for in their 30s. Um, Who were young, elderly people? Well, I mean, part of the question is that it's not, that it's not a question of the youth in politics, it's a question of which youth. And the, the pipeline we have for politics now is that people join when they're 12. And with all due respect, you know, it's kind of it's a club. Like, you know, in university, you can join the young party or you can be an athlete or you can go do something else. And so you have a track of people who are young people in politics. But, of course, they've been shaped at that by the time they actually, say, have elected office by being a young party member for 10, 15 years. And maybe they've been shaped less if they become an MP at 30 than if they become an MP at 50, but it's the same basic phenomenon. And so to make this personal, right, for me the, the heuristic or the, the question is how can I actually do something useful in the world? And if anything, being a civil servant for, ten, for nearly 10 years convinced me that the politicians affect very little um, and, and led me to ask what are the other ways of doing things in the world that are useful? So for me the choice you know, after 10 years in civil service was what do I do next? Politics would have been an option. I decided actually I need to understand how an entrepreneur and a business person do what they do, how you actually change something in the world, worrying about profit and loss, worrying about you know, having to have your money come from someone being willing to pay for what you're doing as opposed to coming from the tax collector. With the hypothesis that that's a skill set that if I then, the next time around I think about what to do five or ten years from now, if I want to go into politics, that's a, that's a whole new skill set I have. Or to put it differently, if I go back to being a civil servant, I know how to regulate the private sector even harder. What a nice answer. Glenn, you've been, you've been circling um, in Brussels for, uh, for ages. For ages, yeah. So you have, uh, you have a great experience. Uh, I mean, do the leaders who gather there really consider 
the needs and wishes of the millennials or is the political reality something completely different? Well, first of all, I, I, I agree with Kustav who said that he entered as a 12. I was pioneer when I was a 12 in Soviet Union, so I wouldn't, either, re I wouldn't either recommend joining a <laughs> party at, uh, at, uh, at 12. Uh, but, and Lucas is certainly on his way, as he, as he said, it's just another step, the private sector. But um, in, I think in Estonia, is, uh, there's no particular need to, to cross over from one to the other. And, and politics is becoming younger. Look, uh, President Macron is a, is a good example. It's becoming younger also in, uh, in, uh, in let's put it that way, traditional uh, democracies. And perhaps politics is becoming more interesting in the sense that uh, that parties are a limiting factor uh, based on very strict worldview and, and voting patterns and whipping and, and all that. Take the mic, take the mic, Glenn. Platform type of uh, democracy is perhaps much more interesting uh, that is now emerging, five-star movement, uh, on march in, uh, in so, so I think also due to technology, politics is changing, the communication infrastructure is changing, so it changes much more. And I don't know a single politician that ignores public opinion, at least in democracies. I mean, even I think in aut autocracies, uh, they do ignore, but eventually uh, it will come to haunt you and it will bite in usually four years' time. So, so um, you don't have perhaps time to tap into and work with the public opinion being in, in a coalition but that's, that's how cycles change also in democracy. So once you fall into opposition, that's time to reconnect. So, so this is a, it's, it's a great thing in democracy. So, so even though the uh, elderly politicians would like to ignore what, uh, let's say, the younger population thinks, technology makes it impossible, basically. I think democracy is a good way. There's no right and wrong in terms of redistributionary politics. So that's why I'm always being of... of of mind that, that social policy should be very close to uh, citizens and linked to, and I, I wouldn't want to Europeanize it, because there's no right and wrong. It's a redistributionary redistrib issue, and I, I, I agree with, uh, with the first speaker uh, on, on taking also structural measures to incentivize, because the older are becoming older. Uh, people were dead uh, probably last century at my age already. So 15, no, was, old, 15 was midlife crisis. <laughs> I mean, I'm now in one, and I'm, I hope at least, I'm not only h even halfway through. So, um, so it changes, and we need to adapt, and we need to bring young people also to adapt democracy to the changing needs because technological revolution is changing it a lot, and we need to bring young people because we need to understand it how this new thing works. Right. Well, uh, I guess that, that concludes the introductory part uh, from the panel. We got to know uh, what, do, what do the panel thinks. And now I want to understand what, what do you guys think uh, of the first three questions that were up on WorksUp. So can we project the answer to the first question, do you follow politics and events related to the EU? 89% follow it and... Uh, 11% don't know if they follow it, and zero said no. <laughs> we have uh, the, the politics very, follows them. Very well informed uh, crowd here. Let's look at the second question. Do you believe that you are able to influence EU decision making? Who said what? On the screens in a second, I guess. Right. So 53% think that yes, they can. Influence EU decision making, 32 said no, and 16 said not sure, or I don't know. Right, well that also s shows something. And the third question was, do you feel that the EU needs a change? Let's see what you guys thought about that. Right, most of you think that the EU needs a change. 19% are happy with the EU as it is, and 14% don't really know if the EU needs a change. Well, good to know, good to know. Uh, we're going to move forward with the panel, and um, ladies and gentlemen, just to encourage you to uh, be active, you, you can also, I mean, uh, be active uh, in an analog old school way, uh, raising your hand and really 
letting me know that you want to ask a question. I'm, I'm not going gonna, gonna to gonna see that immediately, but uh, if you do that long enough, I'm sure I'm going to get your question to the panel. Let's move on with one of my questions. So it seems to me that um, the youth are no longer like traditionally voting for the left and then when they grow up they become more conservative. If you look at a poll conducted less than a year ago in Estonia, the uh, right-wing nationalist party ECRE was the most popular party among the youth and I was surprised by that because I mean I traditionally considered youth being left-wing punk hippie, whatever, anyway, everything else but conservatives. And I want to understand why is that the case. So maybe, uh, maybe Kristen, you can try to uh, help me on that to start off. Why do the young people like uh, conservatives these days? I, I don't think it's an easy question to answer because I don't think I know fully the answer to that question. Um, but I think one... Uh, kind of element to it is the fact that um, politics as usual is not something that appeals to people. So if something is different, it's more bold, um, that tends to be something that kind of uh, <coughs> can bring in people who weren't interested before, can bring in people who felt that politics wasn't speaking to them before. So I think there's that element to it because yes, in Estonia, um, there are some statistics about the ECRE, uh, yet I think it's also exciting to see that in other parts of Europe we can see the Green Party having similar level of popularity, especially if we look at the last European Parliament elections as well. Uh, our Green Party isn't quite to that level to get that excitement out of people. I, I've spoken to many friends who say that they would love for us to have the kind of Green Party that uh, exists, let's say, uh, in Germany, and they would vote for it as well. So I think people are looking for an alternative. They're looking for a different kind of politics, and the impression is that these parties offer that, and that's why they are drawn to it. Gustav, what do you think? I mean, what does the Swedish uh, example tell us? Well, I agree with that of an, uh, young people wanting an alternative. And looking at the Swedish example, it was five or six or seven years ago we had a centre-right government in Sweden, and we had government ministers claiming that they were feminists and that was really astonishing within the conservative party I represent and then we had ministers saying that they didn't really want the more private alternatives when it came to the social sector which was quite astonishing as well because at that time in Sweden we had some kind of a leftist trend it was popular to be involved in, in environmentalist policies which has historically been seen as, as more left-leaning trends. And now we have a conservative trend after that. So I think that if we meet here in five years, we will discuss the, the ongoing trends of liberal policies or of left policies again, because I believe that these things go in trends. One thing that I really uh, have, have noticed in Sweden uh, is that we have a lot of young politicians and a lot of young people claiming to be conservative, but when you talk policy with them, and we, when you discuss, they are not conservative at all. They dress conservative, they want to be stay-at-home moms, they adore the Swedish king, uh, and they do all, the, all these typical conservative things because they want to have the personal lifestyle of conservatism, but they are not really advocating conservative policy. The Swedish support for abortion uh, legislation is an all-time high, so you don't see any conservative backlash on that. And we had Stockholm Pride last week, which was a, a, a huge example of hundreds of thousands people, of, of people walking in Stockholm celebrating these rights. So I would say that it's a, it is also some kind of a personal being rebellistic actions uh, when, we, when it comes to many Swedes being conservative right now. So being a conservative is considered rebel in Sweden these days? Absolutely, because yeah. you are rebel, you're some kind of a rebel towards the grown-ups, the uh, establishment, the, 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 the trending policies which has been shaping Swedish politics for the last 10, 15 years. So of course they see themselves that I would say it, it's quite stupid. Uh, it, it's very stupid. Uh, to you're try not doing to it out from rebellion? No, 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 no. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced by heart conservative. Uh, and I was conservative also when it wasn't popular, uh, not even within my own party. But, uh, but I would say that it's, it's more these days a personal statement rather than a political idea that are symbolizing these conservative trends. So, uh, Glenn, uh, 
And uh, yeah, so what do you guys uh, think? I mean, where have the moderate parties actually um, gone wrong? I mean, Glenn and Lucas, what, 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 what happened for, uh, what was the reason why, why we see this trend uh, for conservative uh, values these days? I mean, was there too much openness, too, many, too much liberal values? Uh, too little uh, explanation, too little understanding in, uh, let's say, in our region, uh, because we were like going in, in in one direction as a society, and then suddenly it seemed like there was this stop and turn. What do you guys think about that? Well, I think liberal democracy's success is also that it is a conservative as well as social democratic value. So probably we should speak of the liberal democratic values versus anything else that is there. So uh, so I, I wouldn't say that the conservatives versus, I mean, EPP type of Christian Democrats are very much liberal, pro-liberal democracy. Uh, I think there's an element, obviously, uh, for young people being Gretel, uh, and, and that's a normal way of life. So I think there's there's obviously an argument in, uh, in, in, in that of being rebellious. Secondly, I think, uh, well, done job was done in mobilizing them. Uh, I suppose I don't have very clear evidence, but I suppose there's um, an element of technology in there. Uh, usually uh, catching up uh, political movements are much better at deploying unusual ways of mobilizing people. Probably it's also because of some of the issues uh, of fear were captured very well. And I think uh, there are also substantive issues of, uh, in, in, in a society that were perhaps ignored in, in by some of the political forces that are out there, especially perhaps the income gap and equality and things like that, which usually mobilize things. So perhaps young people also look at, looked at their parents' uh, livelihoods, etc., cetera, and, and went to the polls and said, enough of it, I don't, I don't like it. So democracy is a great thing of correcting things. So it's also a correction. I'm pretty sure of that. Lucas, is that a correction, and will we see a shift of trend in five years? Well, uh, put your, uh, let's put yourself in the minds of a, maybe a couple of different types of young voters who see themselves, whom, for whom it makes sense, perhaps counter to our intuitions, to vote for a far-right party. Um, the first group maybe doesn't feel that it makes much of a difference, and they've lived in a liberal democracy their entire life. Um, whatever changes it is that this party is claiming to bring, they certainly don't see that these changes are going to fundamentally alter the society they live in. Um, and so they say, well, why the hell not? Because they're getting bombarded by this party's Facebook advertisements, memes, um, 4chan, Twitter, uh, board posts, etc. cetera. Um, what's to be lost? There is also a subset of people that I think Glenn talked about who aren't happy. We, all, we assume that youth equals kind of happy, educated, cosmopolitan people, and that certainly isn't the case. Um, and there's, there's no age limit on living out, you know, an Estonian living outside of Tallinn and Tartu feeling that things aren't going terribly well and wanting a change and being worried about the future. That can be true for a 25-year-old in the countryside as much as it's true for a 65-year-old in the countryside. Um, I think the, the interesting question is whether in those countries where the vote actually has led to a policy change, uh, whether the, the subset of the youth who didn't really care about the change, because I think there's two groups, right? There's a group that says, something needs to change, I'm substantively not happy with politics, and they might be very happy with this. And there's the other group that was basically trolling politics. Whether the group that's, tr that's trolling politics continues with that if it turns out that there are consequences to trolling politics. Um, and the last point is just maybe a statistical quibbling or two. Yes, among a certain age bracket, ECRA had a plurality of, uh, of youth support. That's not the same thing as having a majority. And the numbers are very different across countries. I mean, if you go to the U.S., sure, you will find young MAGA Trump supporters, but, uh, but uh, Democrat versus Republican preferences there skew very strongly with the youth being uh, Democrats. So, but it's also clear in the U.S. that... Uh, be, voting for the right has an impact, that elections are close, and, uh, and so if you vote a certain way because you're trying to troll, well, you end up trolling yourself. Interesting. Uh, everyone in the audience, um, have, have I ignored you? I mean, do you have questions? Do you want to... Oh, I see, I see a hand going up there. Uh, where is the microphone? I'm not really sure about that. Uh, cause, um, 
do we have a mic for the gentleman over there? Or will we do it without a mic and I'm just going to repeat the question to the microphone? Okay, sir, please ask your question. I'm going to repeat it for those of who... Yeah. that they are in many ways obedient or they are categorised as being obedient. And this we saw in Brexit, that young people were meant to vote for the European Union. But the rebellion is, and I think in a way it's a rebellion against the whole way of thinking of this, is that young people should be categorised as a class because that they understand is a mechanism of making them more obedient. It, says that your interests as a young person are fundamentally different to the interests of your parents. And people instinctively understand this is the way of dividing me from my parents. And when they see, as it, with ECRA or with Brexit, that their parents are the rebellious class and they are the obedient class, not only are they embarrassed about it, but they understand there is something fundamentally wrong in that. Mm. Right. Do you have a question or was that the, the, the comment? Well, it's a comment, but it, I'm trying to pose it as a question because I'm trying to interpret what you're saying, but in a different way. Mm. That when you said you, were, you started like, your political life as a young pioneer... <laughs> that's, it I wasn't think the, the political people... life. I'm just saying that I was, uh, in, uh, <laughs> was on my soul, way but, to a party. But, but <laughs> those, I think those young people who are supporting ECRA, that's how they see it. They see that they're being told what to think, to be a young pioneer for the EU or for whatever it is they're supposed to, supposed to think. And they say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the defiant thing. And, and to be, as you said, to be a conservative is the new punk. Right. Uh, any more questions or comments from the audience? Now, as we have a microphone, it makes things much easier. A lady in the left here. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding um, those mobile um, young people who are actually moving around Europe and, and living in different countries. As you can see, I'm representing one of the initiatives here um, in Estonia that e Academy Academy is, um, is implementing. So the question is, do you think that those mobile youth um, can have some, can play some role in, in strengthening Europe, so to say, in um, maybe in, um, in strengthening the value of European um, citizenship, uh, uh, so to say. Maybe they are the key in, uh, uh, in battling the European skepticism or in, in battling the, the extrem extremists' uh, views, uh, so to say, in Europe. Because we know they are moving around, we know they are coming to different countries, and um, if they are important, do you think that the, uh, the um, uh, countries in the European Union, the states, um, can make um, something in order to make them feel more welcomed, so to say? We are uh, working on, um, on different recommendations how to make them feel more integrated uh, in Estonia. And um, do you think that uh, this is something to be, to be done by, by countries in the European Union? So, th so if, did I understand the question correct? Can mobile EU citizens Youth, change yeah. attitudes yeah. Uh, are they in Europe? Are they generally important um, and can they, can they strengthen Europe overall? And if so, what can we do to support this? Right. So well, say. go ahead, guys. Who wants to answer that? 
Well, generally, I think all the programs such as Erasmus are, are the best known in Europe. I think the older generation, especially in our country, has missed out because we joined Union uh, uh, in 2004. So, uh, so a large part of society, perhaps we would need to have Erasmus for elderly people. I, in general, I think the cultural exchange and traveling is pretty good against all sorts of biases against any sort of neighbor, even within your own country. So uh, go for it. So one, one question I would ask when you say mobile youth, I mean, Glenn, you have one image of mobile youth, which is university students uh, spending a semester somewhere else. But I think the single largest group of mobile Euro youth in the EU were relatively young Poles, Romanians, Lithuanians going to do uh, <coughs> labor in the UK. Um, so clearly that integration project didn't work out perfectly uh, because that was one of the motivators for a lot of Brexit voters. So I don't know if that's a constructive answer, um, but, uh, but I think that we have to kind of, when we say mobile youth, we have to be clear on who and what we're talking about. It's not just this one group. The group I think that Clem's talking about, part of the issue though is, I mean, these are people who anyways are educated and cosmopolitan they're out, in their outlook, so probably their views on the EU were fairly positive uh, before they undertook their mobility. And they're probably going to interact mostly with um, university, you know, people in universities or, or certain types of employers who might also share those views. So it's not clear how much, what, what portion of, say, mobile youth of that group in the EU, if they say come to Estonia, are going to end up outside of Tallinn and Tartu. Gustav. I think that uh, the, the, the integration of Europe and, and having young Europeans going to different countries to, to work or to study is, is fundamental. It, it's beautiful. It's, it's great. However, I think it's quite dangerous to say that you know, the Erasmus program and, and everything else serves as trying to make these young Europeans as ambassadors for an idea of European identity or European values. Uh, again, that is, first, first and foremost, uh, quite a paternalistic way of, of looking at young people. And I would say also it's very difficult to, to try to define these European values because I would say that I, my definition of European values is not the same as the Viktor Orban who would define European values or European identity and so on. So I think it's very good that we have that discussion about it, but I'm not really sure that the way forward is to say that we need to have more European integration because we have, need to have more U European common values because then we can end up in a, di in a direction which is very, very different to the so-called values we have today uh, on a common ground. I'll just say a few things. Uh, actually, about uh, Erasmus, it's not just for university students. It's a much broader program than that, but everybody knows the university part uh, the most. But it actually does include far more young people and has uh, wider programs. But I'll say that the Erasmus program, we've had it for 30 years now. And I mean, now we've, we're having serious debates about the European identity and does it exist and what is the European Union? And so then we can ask, well, has it been successful when we're now having this crisis? I like the program, but there's also serious concerns of is it actually working in a way many people hope it is? Uh, I hope we continue. And maybe the problem is that it doesn't have sufficient funding that not enough people get to do this program. So there are many questions there. Yeah, actually, uh it might have been a year ago when I was this, um, this person approached me and saying that we really have a problem in Estonia, that we don't really have enough applicants uh, to uh, take on these Erasmus scholarships, so maybe not everyone wants to go. And we actually had, at one point, I think we actually had more people wanting to come to Estonia than to go from Estonia to other countries. So Erasmus discussion, interesting one, but let's move on with climate, which kind of proves the opposite from... Uh, from what we started off uh, saying that the youth don't really care about politics, the youth seem to care a lot about climate, but to understand, um, yeah, again, the position of the audience, can I ask you again to go to WorksUp, <coughs> enter the event ID, but I mean, if you're already there, you don't have to do that, and there's a question about climate, a uh, relevant question these days for politicians and decision makers, and the question is, should the EU achieve climate neutrality by 2050? Yes, no, I don't know. Go ahead, pick your answer, and I'm going to ask pretty much the same question from the panel here. So, I mean, Glenn, um, the political reality 
is not really clear, is it, uh, among the EU leaders? I mean, uh, there was a failed attempt to sign a document. Uh, where do you actually see this going? Will we, will we have that signature, this, um, yeah, this decision to have climate neutrality by 2050? Or where are, where, are the, where are the problems? What's stopping us? First, uh, I still take the opportunity to answer um, the last thing on, uh, on, on diversity uh, question. And, uh, and I'd say there is a, uh, diversity is a core European value. The, the fact that we accept each other's difference, you don't have that anywhere. So this is why European values are so hard to define, because diversity is the core European value. Uh, but on climate change, um, there are quite many uh, dimensions to it. Uh, uh, first of all, I think uh, it was a little bit overplayed in domestic media because uh, it was a concern and we are undergoing a serious study on how to do this and deciding putting a, an aim somewhere without knowing how, what the social cost or economic cost or ecological cost and what do we need to do and, and, and following that type of herd instinct I would say would have been wrong. So in, in that instance I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't put the discussion over climate change, which we are now to have in September, uh, and the study being commissioned by Stockholm Environment Institute about Estonia being ready, I think, in two weeks. Uh, I think that's the right way to go. We should also tell people what this will take. What does this really mean? It really means a big, big change. I was just coming from another debate on science, and. Uh, I mean, it's an enormous change. Only in energy, in transport, the way we live, the way of mobility. It's, it's just easy to say, let's do this. Why, why 100? Why not 150? 200 percent. But it's an enormous change. But there is also an opportunity. So, so everybody understands if we take the opportunity, we might actually be big winners, especially on the technology, labor, et cetera, side, uh, the ones who adapt first. And it's also a big ethical question. It's, it's because fundamentally it's a question about us because we are the problem. We, the humans, are the problem. Lucas, I mean, we all know Greta Thunberg who sparked uh, a popular movement on September the 20th. There's going to be a massive protest. I mean, where do you see this debate really going? Is, it, is, the, is the gap between the youth and this real politic, is it just enlarging? Will we see more, more protests? Or is that debate actually like moving the planet forward? Well, I don't know where it's fundamentally going to go. I think that uh, there are probably two issues where if you were trying to identify uh, a collective youth position, probably they're the future of our social systems and climate where you have these questions of intergenerational equity. Um, so if you're going to have a youth position, and it's never going to be 100% of the youth, but you're going to have a clear skew, it's going to be on climate, it's going to be on pensions and questions like this. Um, I think one of the challenges in a place like Estonia right now is to think about how youth can also work through other channels than just politics in the narrow sense. So <coughs> what can our companies do to actually explain what we might be able to do to change our behavior patterns? How can NGOs fill that gap in? I mean, uh, it's clear that if we want to have the herd mentality of the herd keeping itself alive, in that sense herd mentalities are good, herds like to not be killed off, um, we have to sort of do something, and that something shouldn't just be limited to what we do through formal political processes. Ultimately, you do need to have the legislation, the framework in place, because we basically have to artificially increase the cost of carbon, and that's going to work through regulatory mechanisms. But in fleshing out how we do that and what the possibilities are, and in a country like Estonia changing the debate, I think maybe the message isn't just that the youth politicians need to do something, but it's the 30-year-old head of strategy in a tech company or the 30-year-old um, head of an NGO doing the hard exercise of thinking, well, what can my organization, what can I do where I'm sitting right now to actually help to that process? And perhaps that's the, the youth engagement we need as much as anything else so that the political decision, when it gets made, is one that's actually makeable. Gustav, uh, how has... Uh uh, is she 15 or is she 16, Greta? How She's getting old. She's 16 now. 16, yeah. Okay. 
How has she changed the political discussion in Sweden? Well, a year ago, nobody really knew who, who she was. She started her school strikes outside the uh, Riksdag uh, in, in Stockholm in August last year when we had general elections in Sweden. So, of course, uh, now she's met the Pope and everyone else. So, of course, uh, she is a big influencer, and, of course, uh, what she does is, is tremendously important. Uh, one nudging thing I feel about the case of Christa Thunberg, now I'm being very conservative, I apologize for that, is that she hasn't really yet defined, and some would say it, it is her role, uh, what should be done. Because she's constantly saying we need to listen to scientists. And of course we can listen to scientists, but the problem is that the scientists as a collective, are, they say a lot of different things. I think that in the climate debate, we need to discuss policy. Not uh, scare each other with dystopia, but dis discuss policy and what can, what can concretely be done. Of course, every individual has a big responsibility. I would, however, say that if you look at now around the globe, we see that 1,800 uh, nuclear uh, uh, coal power plants are being constructed right now, and in China they are constructing 200 big international airports, which would look like Mary Airport to look quite small in comparison to these 200, 300 airports they're building now in China. We must act collectively on that issue. Uh, and we must act collectively uh, on, on having international framework uh, of the big polluters. Uh, but of course, I think that the main contribution that, that Greta Thunberg has made is that we now discuss it, and that now we discuss these issues in Sweden, for example, in almost every political debate there is, uh, and that is good. But uh, I think there is also some, some time now for action. Well, I'll just kind of taking Greta's side in here in the sense that the problem is that people aren't treating it with the urgency that it should be treated with. Politicians especially, it seems like they're just treating it as any other political challenge. It, it seems terrifying how quickly everything is changing due to climate change. And it seems like a doomsday is kind of heading our way very, very soon. And everybody's just kind of sitting on it and kind of discussing and coming to an agreement and then going back on it and not really doing anything toward the agreement as well. So it seems just ridiculous. So I think her role is being that person giving the wake up call and being outraged at this basically inactivity. We're just pretending to do something and we're not. And that's the ridiculous thing. And I feel the same way. And I think she's voicing that thing that many people are feeling. So, Glenn, has she managed to activate uh, leaders in, in Brussels? I mean, this, this movement, when we were saying that the politicians cannot uh, ignore public opinion, and when you look at the polls, climate has climbed up tremendously uh, among the priorities that people list uh, when, uh, when they think about European politics. So when you go to Brussels, I mean, and you've been there uh, a few years now, uh, has the discussion shifted after, well, this movement? Well, even before Greta started to strike in, uh, in front of uh, Riksdag, uh, we already have quite ambitious climate goals. So it's 80% by 2050. And I think even more important was the scientific approach because uh, one thing is obviously a political camp campaign. You can shift that agenda, and I totally agree with Gustav that it has mobilized people. It has brought perhaps, there's perhaps a wider uh, impact on, on young people uh, that they can actually change things. So, so this, there might be a good educational angle to it, but it was there before. It's, it's, the science has said it. We have had a couple of big climate conferences. There are good signs that we as humans can do things, and, and the ozone layer protection has been one of the things where, where over the decades things have started to change for better. But nevertheless, we need to also find the answer. Where do we get the energy from? And I, I don't think people are ready to switch off everything tomorrow for that type of lifestyle change. So we bet on technology uh, a little bit, but it's going to take also a lifestyle, lifestyle change. And the big change also is, is there's going to be 10 billion people or 11 billion people on this planet. So this will be fundamentally big, I mean, and they want to eat three times a day and have a car or two and power in their homes, etc. So that's a big challenge. So in that sense, uh, we need to address it and, and, and also find that Europe is a good way of actually solving these problems. Uh, technological revolution, the geopolitical shift we are going through 
and ecological revolution. These are three things Europe really should be focused on now, and I think this is what also not only young people but all everyone expects. You know, just in terms of theories of change, and this comes back to the question of what the role of elected politics is, it's not a consensus game. It's a 50.1% game, which makes it a numbers game. So, I mean, if Greta changes anything, it's that she moves that dial on the 50.1% a little bit. And that might express itself not immediately in how people vote. It can also express itself in consumption preferences and, you know, whether there's demand for greener options. But... Uh, Ultimately, it has to affect that 50.1% and move the dial. That's the measure of whether it's had an impact or not. I think it's time to see what you guys think about uh, carbon neutrality or climate neutrality. Can we have uh, the poll on the screens? Oh, I think it's pretty clear what the audience wants. 86% of you want, to, want the EU to go climate neutral by 2050. I guess you were considering your um, lifestyle change when you were pressing that A button, thinking about those steaks that you will not eat, of the second car in your household that will have to go, of uh, less Netflix in front of the TV because the TV is just too big and consumes too much energy. Or maybe you didn't. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? I mean, do the, do the young people, do the, 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 the strong voices that are demanding uh, carbon neutral by 2050 or even before, do they actually acknowledge the dramatic shift in lifestyle that it will likely bring? Or is it just uh, like a nice, well, nice thing to say that I want uh, carbon neutrality without knowing what it will actually take? I don't think we have a choice, really. Like, You're ready to give up that state? No, I mean, I, I, I feel like, to be honest, like we're not going to have a choice. We're going to have to change things for sure. Um, but maybe to then also reflect on a topic we discussed earlier, I think you know when we talk about young people and politics, young people do show that we do things in a different way, right? It's like being a vegetarian or... Uh, to, you know, like eating less meat to, because of climate change, or it's buying uh, your clothes from second-hand shops, whatever. Like, taking your own actions, I think this is, a trend, this is something that we do see young people doing, where it's, they feel like they're really making a difference. Um, and there are more who do it, but I, again, young people are not the homogenous group, so not all of them do it, not all of them look at it this way. Um, so, yeah. Basically, I... I would like to say, I th I, in a way, it's not the relevant question because we don't really have a choice with this. We just have to act and we have to reduce. Um, but uh, the younger generation shows good examples of ways to do it uh, and taking lead, so uh, I'm optimistic about it. Right. The audience, do you have questions or comments on that? Oh, we do have uh, one white uh, sweater over there with a hand up. All right, go ahead. Um, perhaps to, well, not uh, provoke you, Clen, but um, I just wanted to make a comment on the fact that European Union has had all sorts of solutions and maybe some wins also in terms of, you know, policy. And, you know, I can name, for example, the uh, renewable, renewable plastics thing. But um, I think, of course, the um, change starts from individual level and we all have to do it. But to be honest, like the real impact would come from the big players making a big, big impact, but we haven't seen that. We, we really need to uh, challenge the status quo to actually make a big change because those small, small initiatives, even if they have been there for like 10 years or whatnot, they haven't really made an impact that would be urgent enough or you know, big enough because you know, the sense of urgency is there. Well, can I say that, I mean, just a couple of hundred kilometers from here, the power station has stopped producing electricity. So that's an answer for you. The, the government is considering how can it uh, work with the miners now. So that's a very, very real impact on Estonian power production. You should, uh, you should look around what the ETS that has been invented to, to, uh, to change and bring about the shift in electricity production, industrial uh, production and, and, and transport will do. So it has a very, very real change. 
And the good thing I'm saying that we cannot coordinate individual level action. Uh, industrial level action we can, uh, and Europe has done some great work. And the problem is that with individual action is that who's going to blink first, because it's a cost issue as well. So if everyone takes the cost and shares an understanding, we can actually achieve that much better rather than Sweden going it alone, because Swedish industry will then suffer Swedish electricity prices, etc. So if we do it in a coordinated way, we, I think, can achieve that type of challenges much, much better. You go ahead, Lucas. Without, without, making, without passing moral judgment, I mean, part of the practical problem you have is that, first of all, Estonia is one of the countries that will be least impacted, right? So the kind of the, the feedback loop of actions, the consequences is weaker here. But let's actually look at a broader paradox. And I, I say leaving aside the moral justice question, because if you go back into history, who's polluted more, it's a more complex picture. But right now, criticize European leaders as much as you do. They're the ones that globally have been pushing for all the measures that would have impact. Maybe they should have been pushing for more, but uh, the difficulties have been getting the U.S., China, India to sign on, all of which, including the U.S. in particular, are countries that will suffer more. So the paradox we have right now is that Europe, that in aggregate, yes, it will suffer, absolutely, there will be difficulties and dislocations, but actually will suffer less from climate change, is trying to do a whole lot more about it than the rest of the world, which will suffer more. And that, that leaves aside the moral question of, again, Developing countries haven't had the chance to emit as much, so perhaps they can counter with the fairness argument, but the fact of the matter is they're doing less and they'll suffer more. More questions from the audience? Yep. There's a question over here. Can we get a mic there? Mic's coming. Hi, I'm Mike. No, it's over here. Hi. Um, you made a criticism of Greta's campaign and the climate campaigns around it, which is that it doesn't contain any actionable policy directives. Uh, that slightly ignores the extent to which the youth belie um, believe that anything that they do that is productive is achieved outside of policy and the very narrow scope of politicians. Uh, I apologize for using American polling here. I know it's not European, but there's a lot of evidence that suggests that over two-thirds of the youth believe nothing is achieved, worth achieving is achieved through the conventional political system. The only way to mitigate against that is to get the youth involved in policy direction, if that's the outcome that you want. How, do you, how would you suggest that that is achieved? Did you get that? I didn't really catch... How, how to involve young people in policy? The, yeah, the if the criticism is that the campaigns that the youth care about do not contain actionable uh -huh. policy directives, the only way to mitigate that is to get the youth involved in policy making, which they don't want to do. How do you do that? It wasn't much of a criticism of, of, the, of the movement. It, it was uh, more of a criticism of, of Greta Thunberg, uh, if I were to have one, because I really I want to really point it out. I think that she's doing a tremendous job. But if I were to be a bit critical, I would say that it's, it's, uh, it's, it would be better if we came down and talked about concrete reforms. I would say that one thing that my own political party has done in Sweden is that you know having a political party as the moderate party where the youth league is bigger than the, than the big party when it comes to membership Means, means that we have a lot of things to, to say uh, and we have a lot of things to, to point out when it comes to the internal policy making. That is one way political parties can work. Uh, I would say that the European Youth Forums and other, uh, the European, um, helping with this, uh, the European Youth Representatives and the Youth Representatives to the United Nations and, and everything yes. that we have yeah. is also a good way of trying to formalize uh, one way into to decision making, but also encourage the movement that we see because we need more of the Fridays for Future. And I think that I really hope that this movement will continue to grow. But one thing that I will hope will come out from this is that instead of having a big news buzz in Swedish newspapers about Greta Thunberg going over the Atlantic, seeing a boat, which really consummated the, 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 the whole news in Sweden last week of having this boat trip, uh, you know, the gossipy thing around her, I would say that it would be better if we tried to, to bring smart people together and try to focus on, on, on how to deal and address uh, the concrete issues. I think that the way she started 
is very good, but I think that politicians need to do more and to involve uh, young people as well. Lucas? Just from a, ultimately from a private sector company perspective, because we talk about the Green New Deal and we talk about the big R&D that needs to happen, uh, the thing you really want is certainty that the demand is actually going to be there. And as I said before, the issue is that the demand is artificial in the sense that you need to raise a, the cost of carbon, right? And this is the big picture of what we need to do. We know. I mean, we've had the Kyoto Protocol for a long time. We've had international agreements where we know it was agreed and we know it was set out to be agreed and we kind of know what we weren't able to agree to but what we should be doing. So what we're, we're actually someone like Greta Thunberg helps even if she doesn't have specific proposals, because those specific proposals are already out there, if she helps create an environment where a company might think, well, this isn't just a couple of politicians, this has broader support, give them some kind of confidence that this might actually translate into political change, which makes it more worthwhile for them to actually spend time on thinking, well, what can I do now to get ahead of this trend? Because what you really want is you want everyone to think it's inevitable that we're going to have the political pressure to do something, so I might as well get on board now. So if, if she can do something to make it more inevitable, that's great. But of course, that brings us back to the 50.1% question. I'm just curious, uh, how has this debate, uh, or if this debate, has changed your mind about the 2015 climate goal? So can I ask the kind technicians to put that question again on a workshop? So the question is, should the EU achieve climate neutrality by 2050? I mean, I'd be very happy if you answered that again. And those of you who have changed your minds, go ahead and do that. Those of you who still think that's the case, that'd be good to know. Let's move on with technology. Uh, it, it has slipped through the debate uh, several times already, talking about democracy in a digital era where people consume their news via social networks. And that's something that's been puzzling me for a while, and something that I can't really answer on my own is this fundamental question about freedom of speech and the responsibility of platforms. And I want to ask you guys, what do you think, I mean, um, how do democracies survive in the era of internet and social networking? I mean, should we regulate those platforms where people are consuming this information more? I mean, as we are, let's say, regulating, I don't know, we were discussing before about nuclear energy, right? As we are regulating all those atoms that are radioactive. I mean, maybe a bad comparison. But let's say, should Facebook have a responsibility of the content that is up there? Gustav, what do you think? Well, my, my spine reaction is to say that I think that the, the, all legislation should be tech neutral uh, because trying to regulate and, 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 and subsidize and, and legislate when it comes to, to tech platforms would be devastating since tech platforms tend to develop quite faster than legislation processes do. Uh, I would say that the main interest from, from my perspective is that we have a European solution to this problem and to this issue. I'm not sure how this would look, I'm not sure how it would, would act, I'm not sure how it would be, but I think that having these new trends that we're seeing, uh, the, the only solution to it is to have legislation which is, in the best of worlds, totally global. But since we don't live in the best of all worlds, uh, I think the solution would be European legislation for it. Right. Glenn, uh I think it's fair to say that we might not have Brexit if there wasn't Facebook, or it would have turned out perhaps differently. Would you agree with that? And could you? Yeah, I know you watched a good series recently or a good documentary. Talk about that. Well, I think the argument is is there on on technology, and I wouldn't say Facebook. This was Facebook only leaked the client data. Uh, it was the Cambridge Analytica that uh, made the uh, personnel pro profiles and ad targets, and also then you deployed Facebook as an as an uh, as a technology uh, to to deliver a a very personalised message, and obviously with artificial intelligence, with uh, voice, picture, etc., being uh, being also qu quite human-like, let's put it that way, 
uh, this will change politics. But I think the technology itself is, is perhaps not so important. It's, it's important, but it's, it's what it does and what it does to the, to the society. And, and we come from industrial society, very hierarchical. We have parties, we have governments, parlaments, media, uh, Fifth Freedom, etc., are part of that. And this reflects the communication infrastructure of society. In technology, you have something which is called Conway Law. And the Conway Law will say that the society or something we will build will reflect the communication architecture. So the platform thing is, is not hierarchical. It's community to community. And it has enormously empowered the voiceless. So, uh, so technology was one of the things, but it also has empowered a bit of society that didn't have a voice. So there are also real issues about it. Uh, I think the, um, the, the, I don't know, the purity of the original state of the inventors of internet that you know, they imagined a very different way of society uh, coming along with it. Uh, and, uh, and the freedom that comes with it. Technology is a two-way sword. You can do good with it and you can do bad with it. It's dependent on the intentions and I don't think technology is ready. I mean, it's, it's self-conscious in that way. So, so it depends what you want to do with it and then do. So, uh, so probably there needs to be a regulation like Gustav said and probably yeah. at the European level. Right, yeah, exactly. I'm tempted to talk about that side of the sword uh, that uh, gives us fake news. Uh, and, uh, I mean, as it is an emotional issue, often uh, a fearful message, it uh, just gets blown up on Facebook and on social media. I mean, you're dealing with technology on your daily uh, basis. What do you think? Do we need a regulation to really uh, regulate this thing? Let, let me give you a less philosophical answer, right? And let's talk about concrete particulars. Europe and the U.S., in the end of the 90s, the early 2000s, engaged in an experiment where we said we would treat a whole bunch of different types of websites, businesses, as mere intermediaries. And we created a legal framework around that. And the issue isn't in the abstract, was that a good, or a good idea or a bad idea? At the time, it was a good idea. It's brought a lot of benefits. Let's bring it down to concrete companies, right? Because it's, it, may, it may or may not be that there are abstract forces of the market that would make what Facebook did inevitable. But the fact of the matter, very concretely, is that Facebook, Twitter, and a few other companies had specific executives who had specific information at specific points in time about the risks that they were dealing with, the amount of energy they were putting into supervision of what was going on or not, and they were saying publicly, trust us, you don't need to regulate this, we got it, but then they didn't. And they weren't doing the things that were within their power as operators of these private companies, in a way no different from an editor operating a newspaper that, you know, who, who at the same time has to deal with both the editorial side and the advertising side. They made certain choices, they ran their companies in certain ways, and they had deleterious effects. So we can imagine an alternate universe in which the people running Facebook, Twitter, and a few other companies took a different approach to their responsibility, and within the freedom they had legally to run their companies they see fit, say, based off it, crafted one type of ecosystem. And maybe bits of what we have would have happened anyway, and bad things with fake news could have happened, but perhaps there wouldn't have been uh, the data leaks that we had, perhaps there wouldn't have been foreign money advertising, perhaps you wouldn't have been able to carry out the micro-targeting, and we'd be having a different discussion. So I think this abstract discussion, do, how do we regulate internet companies, that was a theoretical discussion we could have in 2000 with theoretical general hypotheses. Now we have concrete evidence on how it's turned out, and the fact of the matter is that the regulatory approach we took had negative approaches. And let's not say that it's, do we regulate them or not? We currently regulate them. We gave them a regulatory opt-out to a lot of rules. Now maybe we should reevaluate that. I don't think we throw out the baby with the bathwater. And there's this question of where do we draw the boundaries? Because if we take the legal fiction that both the EU and the US created, where these companies are mere conduits and we get rid of it together, then yes, a lot of internet-based business falls apart. Maybe, the, maybe we don't use media regulation. Maybe it's about competition law. Maybe it's about liability law. Maybe it's about just having Facebook follow some of the rules on foreign interference and foreign funding of advertising for elections that other media companies have to follow. But something has to change, and it's perfectly appropriate for lawmakers to say, well, we tried one approach. It didn't work. Let's try another. Is Facebook a media company? Um, I would say yes, because... 
let's put it, let's turn it around. For them not to be a media company, they really would need to not understand what was going on, right? The differences between Facebook and an ISP, where the ISP really says, I get bits and bytes and I deliver you your bits and bytes. Facebook knows a whole lot about the bits and bytes. They do a whole lot to optimize what happens with those bits and bytes. They may not be a media company to the same extent that uh, Estonian Public Broadcasting is or that Postimes is, but they certainly, if the measure of whether you're a media company is whether you're making editorial decisions or you're thinking about editorial content and running your business based on that, I'd say they are. In the same way that Google, there's certainly the part of Google that runs YouTube is. I mean, YouTube hires artists, hires media editors to craft uh, content. That's what a media company does. I mean, how far from uh, the political reality uh, is, I mean, how far are we from that moment where Facebook in the EU level is treated as a media company with the same regulations, Glenn? I mean, uh, is that debate moving into that direction or is Facebook still like a neutral platform that has some rules but not, nothing comparable to the ones that the media companies have I to abide by? I think there are two things. One of the, uh, as Luca said, there are many layers. In One is the media law and audiovisual media services. I'm sure that's been treated, but I don't think it's, it's yet media. What Lucas was, uh, was referring to was the... Uh, rather commercial regulation which says that we are just a platform. Today it has an opt-out by which is unlinked to the content. So it's not responsible for content. And that's gonna change. I'm pretty much, uh, and that's also not, not only Facebook, but the second biggest or even the bigger uh, advertising company, which is Google uh, and its, uh, its analytic tools, etc. So, uh, and perhaps Amazon in the future. Uh, this is in so the pipeline. I mean, in Brussels, this is in the pipeline. You think the next commission will do something about that? Pretty sure it will. And I would encourage you to read uh, the French commissioned a, a study on, uh, on media law and, uh, and technology. And I think there's, there's a lot of uh, in it that's probably been also being pushed by the French government in the future, uh, which doesn't take a European approach, by the way, which says that we need to do, because democracy happens locally, we need to do it locally. But it has a, a, has a lot of good uh, analysis in it. And this, the other thing I've read uh, with great interest was the uh, Information Commissioner's Office in UK has done some great research of the Brexit referendum on the technology and democracy. They are really, really good, so mm. do read them. All right. Uh, Kristen, what do you think, what, what potential do you see um, w when we look at the other side of the sword? Uh, we've, we've been talking about fake news and we, I think most of you agree that something needs to be done on the EU level to stop that. But, uh, but, but digital democracy, I mean, it doesn't only have to be uh, bumped up fake news. This, should all, this could also be taking input from citizens via using all the digital channels, all the platforms, all the apps that we have uh, to communicate with people. I mean, this, I mean, we live in the internet. Uh, is this that you see great potential, unused potential perhaps for uh, modern democracy? I think so. I mean, I, um, my background is working for a pan-European NGO that had many member organizations and ultimately um, uh, hundreds of millions of uh, members uh, indirectly represented. So it's, it, it ended up being that we could work very efficiently and very inclusively uh, in our work even, ensuring democracy within our organization and being able to um, get views into our work and our research from different countries around Europe, making us actually representative in what we do. So in practice, it's, it's very possible and there are great tools that are available to us today. Um, Pepe Grillo is using them in Italy with his five-star movement. Is that a good example? I mean, again, I mean, Glenn started with this. You know, you can use it for anything. It's, it's down to the people who use it. You know, Internet as such isn't good or bad. Uh, it's down to what we make of it. I tend to see more of the good sides. Uh, but I met people who think all social media is bad, period. And there's no further discussion. Um, I, I don't think it's to that level. I think it's brought many great things. Uh, you know, many people can watch us online right now. They can hear this discussion from their couch at home or wherever they're traveling for holidays. Um, 
I wouldn't want to give that up. And my even my European identity is based on the fact that uh, I can discuss with people all over e Europe. And I mean, if we make friends today, you know, we could keep chatting on WhatsApp uh, forever. So it's. I, I no, think there's a lot of hope and great things yeah. in it there. But as I mean, well. taking input from uh, from citizens via digital channels. I mean, Gustav, what do you think of the experiment that the Five Star Movement in Italy is doing, where they claim this is a modern democracy? This is how parties or political movements these days they don't consider themselves as a party. This is how they should build up their ideology. This is how they should develop their programs, getting direct feedback uh, from the citizens via the digital channels. Do you think that's a viable solution? That's the future of democracy? Well, I think that the Italian government has, has uh, resigned today, right? Yeah, that's... Uh, the, yeah. <laughs> well, so, no, but I think that uh, uh, that is, of course, one way to, to do it. And, of course, one way uh, in order to try to develop your policy and, and being very, very down-to-earth and grassroots uh, rule and everything. I think that they miss one fundamental point when it comes to politics, and politics is about values and ideology. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of values and ideologies in a country, and, of course, it's impossible to combine all of them. And in the, at the end, I think that it will only be messy. Uh, but, of course, you can be very, very short, short, uh, short time successful with, uh, having these kinds of, of, of instruments. But I don't think it's, it's successful in the long run. Glenn? What I wanted to add was that uh, when I a little bit studied uh, the Brexit uh, case in, uh, in, in depth, also the scientific science behind it, including the psychological profiling, etc., was, what was really valuable what was, of course, a media platform for, for targeting ads and, and reaching people, but uh, the real value is in data. And, uh, and we, we with Lucas have thought a lot about the European digital single market and, and how to put that data to use for new business models and, and, and uh, better products uh, European companies can have. But we haven't given a lot of thought in, in the data we have in the government databases for politics because this would also be a way of making that available on a level playing field because the problem with Brexit was actually non-level playing field. One party had access, huge amount, amount of data and the other party didn't. We need to find a way of level playing field, giving all political movements that are recognized as parties access to that data and knowing not at the personal level, at the personal data level, but in the problems level because we can have a lot of data out of what we have, the health information, the works information, the education information, what the problems really are and what the solutions could be. So we need to find a way to data uh, to give actu actually access of political parties to it as a resource because we control media as a resource for politicians because that's an important way of reaching citizens. We treat money uh, in uh, political campaigns. We should also treat data in political campaigns and see that none of the players have an advantage in terms of having a huge client database with much of the data illegally gathered uh, about the citizens but actually everybody had a data to it and then run a campaign and get more knowledge about the, the, the country they live, the problems we have, and the solutions also we have because we have enormous amount of data also as a, as a government. Mm -hmm. We haven't figured that uh, angle out. Mm -hmm. Right, guys. Uh, do you have questions or comments concerning uh, democracy in a digital era? Either be it on the fake, uh, fake news side uh, or direct democracy, or using free movement of data as an equal platform for all. No, nope, I don't think so. No? All cool? No questions? Okay. Can we see what you guys thought about the, the climate question before we move forward? Oh, you see? This debate actually changed something. So the political reality uh, seems to have hit you. 80% uh, of you answered that yes, the EU should be climate neutral by 2050. I think that was 94% before, right? I think the dinner is cancelled, right? So no, no, no. No dinner today. Yeah, no. and 20, no 20, says, 20 says no. 
Right, so it, uh, well, we don't know how many of you uh, answered before and this time, but I mean, maybe so, that shows something. So, so, so basically we had a realistic discussion and we quashed everyone's optimism, or at least some of the optimism in the room. Isn't that sad? Not again. <laughs> <laughs> right, guys, um, I mean, we could pick another topic, uh, because I mean... Uh, so I have an, just an observation, and this is this is a meta point, right? But I, it's something that's been bothering me is that uh, we're a pretty crappy youth panel, and uh, in, in two ways, right? One is that uh, uh, I don't know everyone's age here, but I know Clint is over thirty. I know I'm over thirty, and we don't have anyone under twenty, right? Um, so we don't have, you know, my my sister's uh, ninth grade compatriots who uh, I think. Five out of eight that she did an informal survey of wanted to vote for ECRA and who aren't thinking about politics. And then we also have four people who are in one way or another part of the elite who are active in politics, who are civil servants, who used to be civil servants and, and, and now work in a company in a sort of white collar position, who are running civil society movements. We're not emblematic of the disaffected youth. So, I mean, if we're going to have in the future a panel about youth and politics, we literally need to go and grab a pie to teenager. Maybe someone who, you know, who, who speaks English, but frankly, Estonians have some of the best English in Europe, so that shouldn't be a problem. And find a way to bribe them to be here for an hour and a half <laughs> and give honest answers, because I think that might give us some more insight um, into the mythical youth than, than four unrepresentative samples. But as someone who's worked for a youth movement, I've been to so many events and panels where there's no young people discussing about young people. We're a bit better than those panels, I would say. But you're right, like, if you want to talk about young people, you need to talk with young people, and they need to be at the table for sure. Right. One more topic uh, in this already uh, vivid mixture of uh, different ideas uh, is, let's talk, I mean, when we're talking about technology, it's clear that the future of the labor market is somewhat different than uh, what we've uh, grown used to. Now, this was one of the topics we discussed with you over the phone that is actually a problem for the youth or is an important issue for the youth. So let's bring that on uh, for, the, for the last 10 minutes of, of our discussion. I mean, how do you think, um, I mean, how will the app economy change uh, the careers uh, of, uh, of tomorrow? What are the problems that you actually see there? I mean, is uh, social tax one of the one of the worst that we should talk about? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely one of the bigger questions of what are the social security systems in place now with our interesting new jobs driving Ubers or Bolts or uh, whatever else there is, and how do we catch up with that? Um, I, I don't know what the progress on the European... Uh, Pillar on social rights, is that the right way to say it? Yeah, we can check that with Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is, uh, but that's a major question of how will, you know, those people who are not contributing towards their pensions now, uh, who might not have uh, health care, um, how do we adapt to this new type of work? Really? Companies not paying tax. Exactly. So, I what do you do about that? I mean, yeah. I, I, I think it's a, part of the issue with this question is it has the, 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 the extent to which it's a problem really varies by country. And I think it's less of an issue in Estonia, for instance, where because we basically designed our social system later, it's less dependent on companies, right? It's, it's more straightforward to be a sole proprietor, to pay your social tax, to contribute to your pension. It's not perfect, and people have a short-term incentive perhaps not to do that. But it's not as big a challenge for Estonia to adjust its, uh, its pension and, and, uh, and various welfare state provisions to work with this. In fact, it's much more just an enforcement question of applying the current legislation than it is for a country where health care and pensions really go through employers. Um, and that relates, it's come back, comes back to the broader youth unemployment question, where it becomes a huge equity question in a, in a country like uh, Italy that has not been able to carry out structural reforms in how its labor market works. But a lot of you know, youth unemployment as a question isn't a separate political issue in many countries in Europe because youth do fairly decent jobs at getting work and I mean if I look at the app economy in Estonia I admit I don't have the numbers but if I look sort of purely and it's purely experiential right if I look at 
the average age of an Uber driver in Brussels, where I lived for four years, versus the average age of an Uber or a taxi fi driver in Estonia, I don't see it as a youth issue in Estonia. I mean, there may be some issues with, uh, with making sure that people who are working for the app economy are paying their social taxes, but it's, as much, it's probably more of an issue for the 55-year-old who maybe is not making the right pension contributions versus in, in Paris or in Brussels where it really is young people who are taking these jobs for lack of other opportunities. So I think it's, it's one of those issues as a lot of other, you know, before we had climate come as a, as a political issue and people talked about youth political issues, they talked about a lot of pseudo issues that were more reflections of the fact that the welfare state in southwestern Europe, uh, and I guess that includes France um, and, and so on, really hadn't modernized itself. But that wasn't a youth issue. That was a can't reform your welfare state issue that happened to impact youth a lot. Glenn, how's the social pillar doing? I'm the fact check guy. Yeah, um, the political reality <laughs> check guy. <laughs> okay, uh, one of the most interesting books I've um, read lately was um, was Shoshana Zuboff's book uh, about surveillance capitalism, and she makes a point. Uh, she makes a point over uh, what uh, technology's impact in in the overall welfare and social model, and she basically says that uh, that digital technology capitalism, which we are pretty much living now is going to break the labor relations because the industrial model of society is built on labor relations. So we have democratic, democratic model, which is a correction mechanism, but we have also trade unions talking to industry. There is no need for trade unions for digital uh, technology. So it will break a social model, and that will be the real fundamental problem of, of redistribution and welfare society. So that's her bottom line. I think there's... There's certainly a point in there. Not only the the democratic issue, the disruption of of, uh, but we are living a general purpose technologies revolution. So it will change uh, the e economy model. Second point, I think, from the European point of view and the social model point of view, that again uh, uh, we've worked with Lucas a lot on the digital single market. So on the upside of of that technology, so generating a big market having uh, a lot of opportunities in a single market for uh, companies to operate and then obviously uh, compete with China and, and US. I think with this legislative cycle, we are moving towards the issues of digital taxation because I think socially is not acceptable that the business advantage is, is, has been got through the not paying taxes. I think everybody accepts the basic fact that if you have a better business model, it's all right. But if mom and dad's shop will have to pay taxes and the internet company will, doesn't have to, it's not a fair competition. And this is a fundamental issue in a society. Second of all, I think the platform workers uh, will be in the scope of work. Uh, they will be called workers. The business model cannot be that the taxi companies pay social tax and the platform companies will not. So I'm sure this issue will be addressed because this issue will end up in a ballot box. These guys were voting for Brexit, were voting for radical forces in society. Because radical forces tap into that left-behind force. We need to reconnect with that and see that this model of our society still uh, works. Gustav, you agree with that? Uh, to some extent, yes. Uh, but I would say one observation from Sweden is that if we look at Uber, for example, uh, and looking also at the 163,000 refugees my country took in 2015, which I must admit was a good decision by my government to do. Uh, a lot Coming from a conservative, you heard that? A conservative who has been arrested in Kampala for gay rights. Huh? Right. Uh, <laughs> So well, that is a rebel thing in yeah, Sweden, that's, I understand. That's really <laughs> uh, 163,000 refugees in 2015, many of whom have been working as Uber drivers. And the alternative to that is to not work at all, which would lead to, to further, government uh, uh, further government spending and subsidies and everything else. So, of course, it's, it's not good if you really fond of the traditional labor market uh, systems and it's not good to have these revolutionary 
uh, models coming through and no politicians or no legislators really know how to deal with it. But I think for the, for the ordinary men and women working with these issues and working as Uber drivers, this has been the real alternative of them of not having a job at all. And that has also led to a very good integration in Sweden. So, of course, I can see that the app-driven app economy is very good and has served as a very good role model for, for integration processes when it comes to refugees. Mm -hmm. Just in, in response to the stories, obviously, that's, that's one side. And I, I'm all for that, you know, people like me, if I want, can drive at the evening uh, for one hour and, uh, or two hours and make some extra money, etc. part-time job. But for, I've read a very interesting piece in Estonian news media about the taxi driver, how his work has changed over the last three years. He has turned from a worker into an entrepreneur, not paying taxes anymore, no working regulation, no timing, so perhaps uh, becoming also dangerous, and, and fairly radicalized over, over this type of change. And eventually, the only way possible for a correction is at the ballot box. They'll go to a ballot box and say what they like or not, unless politics deals with it. Well, looking at the time, it seems it's time to wrap up. If there's a comment from the audience that, like, you really need to get out, that is the time now. That is the time to give your comment. If not... I would ask Lucas to wrap this up because he's uh, he's on the like the most tech savvy guy among us, I guess. So, what do you see uh, the app based economy? I mean, how how does it have to change not to radicalize societies and to still have this element of innovation and bringing the economy forward? I maybe I'm too blasé about it, but. Uh Effectively, if we're, making, if we're making sure that we apply the same working time regulations, the same pension regulations, if, if, if as Clint says, we treat work as work, that's really all we have to do. And maybe this is a too simplistic Estonian way of thinking of it, that we think this is kind of making those legislative changes with, is within the realm of the possible. Um, and maybe if I were to pull that to my sort of broader contribution to the wrap-up, um, if politics works and does what it's supposed to do, and, and that includes connecting to policy, right, which is often civil servants and ministries working off of you know, analysis and, and facts and not doing a very good job connecting to voters in the media. But if those two can connect with each other and actually can adjust and react in a sort of human time frame of months and years, not decades, then maybe we don't need to have too many youth and politics panels. Well, that's a great wrap-up, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening. Before you head out to that um, vegetarian uh, dinner, 80% 80, 80 of you at least, uh, can I ask you to open up um, works up one last time? Uh, I have a question that, you, uh, that I have to ask you to answer. Uh, that's a good question, actually. Uh, then the question is, do you find today's event a good form for exchanging opinions and ideas related to the EU? <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> yes, no, or I don't know. You have uh, 30 seconds to pick your answer. And then we're going to see the results. I'm going to give you another, another 20 seconds there. I think it was a good, uh, good way. I'm biased, of course, but uh, I enjoyed the conversation. We're going to see if the audience did as well. The sun even came out. <coughs> so 10 last seconds, and then we're going to look at the answers. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see what you thought. <laughs> wow. Was that one how, person? Yeah, how many people? Well, we need to have how independent many? electoral can you, commission. Can you raise your hands who, who did that? <laughs> that well, okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, more than three, four people. <laughs> Thank you very much for participation. Thanks very much for the panelists. See you around. <laughs>